know, vaccine hesitancy is one of those things that's crept right into the general conversation. And unfortunately, it has missed some of the definition pieces. So I sat on the committee that did the World Health Organization definition for that. And to be vaccine hesitant, it means that you are not accepting a vaccine even though it's available. So if you can't get a vaccine because it's not at the clinic where you are, you are not hesitant because you're not getting it. And it varies by context, by time, by place, and by vaccine. And we know three major factors influence it, confidence, complacency, and constraints or convenience. So for example, Jay, if you were working at a by the hour job and you had to take time off that job to take your child to get immunized or for you're pregnant to get yourself to go and get immunized you're not getting paid well you're taking that time off and that may make a difference about whether you're going to eat that night or feed your family or whether you're not so that constraint may be why you're hesitant it has nothing to do with safety or concerns about the vaccine at all so the confidence piece is about the concerns about the safety or trust in the government or trust in the uh, people that are giving you the vaccine and then complacency vaccine preventable diseases are not really seen by very many people anymore so they've got lots more things going on in their life and you take my kid to soccer instead of taking him to get his immunization or you know i want to go out for dinner with my husband so i need to rush through and get all of this stuff done instead of going to get my vaccine. I've got more things that are more important and without realizing how incredibly important immunization is. So one of the things that, let me do this in two different ways, um, Jay. Number one is between 1900 and 1999 in Canada, we gained 30 years in survival. 25 of those 30 years are due to only three things. Clean water and sanitation and immunization are 20 of those 25 years. Antibiotics are the other five. And then everything else we did in medicine, open heart surgery, chemotherapy, everything else we did got us five years. Puts it in perspective, doesn't it? The other thing, the reason we talk about vaccine preventable diseases, the diseases that we have vaccines for are because we can't fix the damage that's done after you get the disease. So if you're paralyzed with polio, I can't fix that polio. If you're on a ventilator in an ICU as a pregnant woman with influenza, I can't fix that lung damage. If you have measles, and you get measles encephalitis, I can't fix that brain damage. So the whole point of these diseases are, we've gotta be up, upstream and f prevent them before you get them because we can't fix them afterwards. It's a pretty big problem. People are very cautious about giving anything to pregnant women. It's a, it's a leftover from the whole thalidomide disaster, and we need to not make small of that. That was a tremendous, tremendous catastrophic event. But because of that, people are super cautious, and they've become super cautious around vaccines or giving anything to a pregnant woman, where we know, there's huge safety data for influenza vaccine in pregnant women tons and tons of studies, hundreds of thousands of people, I mean, pregnant women, study. And it's a really safe vaccine. And yet we know influenza, a number of studies done in Canada and elsewhere, if you compare women who are not pregnant, and then you look at them when they are pregnant and their risk of being hospitalized be, during the influenza season because of flu, if you have no comorbidities, you've got about a two-fold increased risk of being hospitalized. If you have comorbidities, you have almost an eight-fold increased risk of being hospitalized. This is not small, okay? And we want to prevent that. So, and the benefit is not only to the mother for influenza vaccine, it's also for the baby. Less small for gestational age babies, pre pre um, prevention of influenza in the first couple of months of life. And you need to know the hospitalization rate for influenza for kids under six months is higher than it is in the elderly.
Most people don't know that. And we cannot give flu vaccine under six months. It doesn't work, okay? So the best way to protect that baby is to give it to the mother to protect her and to prevent the baby by being, uh, the antibodies are passed over through the placenta and they help protect the baby for the first couple of months of life. Same thing for pertussis. Whooping cough is the highest mortality rate for anybody for whooping cough is in under three months of age. We can't effectively immunize you. We start your immunization at two months of age, we can do it six weeks, but you're not protected until you've had a couple of doses and that takes time. So the best way to protect that baby, immunize the mother. Have it pass through the placenta, protect the baby. And I've never met a mother who didn't, want, who didn't love her baby and didn't want to save her baby. So I think it's a matter of helping everybody in the community understand the importance of immunization in pregnant women. So they're being supported to do this. So they're not having a neighbor going yuck, 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 yuck about how dangerous it is when these are not dangerous vaccines. They're well studied. And the danger is to the baby and the mother if they're not given them. Absolutely. One of the biggest things we know when studies have been done in Canada among pregnant women, the number one reason they did not get immunized, their healthcare worker never brought it up. It wasn't because they were anti-vaccine or even hesitant. Nobody even talked to them about it. So it's very important that the healthcare worker bring it up, the obstetrician or the midwife or the family doctor. But the other part is sometimes we'll have an obstetrician, midwife, or family doctor that are pro-vaccine and are gonna bring it up, but the nurse who's out there isn't, or the clerk that's registering them is giving them the bad information. So we have to be careful that our clinics and our offices and our hospitals are immunization friendly to pregnant women. In other words, we make it easy. We don't make you come back for a second visit. We do, you know, we make it convenient for you, you know, and so on and so forth. We know that most of our decisions around risk perception, in other words, should I take a vaccine, they're based on what our beliefs are. And if the belief I have agrees with the fact that's coming in, I hear the fact. If the belief does not agree with that fact, I don't even hear the fact. So what you have to do when you're talking to somebody who can't hear you because it's contrary to their beliefs, you have to rewrap those facts in a way that they can hear. So a flip answer is data tells, but stories sell, okay? So for clinicians, actually having your own personal cases, when you have seen a mother who's ended up in the ICU with flu, or you know a mother who had a baby whose baby ended up in the ICU with pertussis or died, those are powerful stories. Okay, and those are the kinds of things that you can tell them all the statistics in the world, but those stories will really help sell. The next point, and I'm saying this very um, carefully, um, the World Health Organization Euro Unit um, did a document which you can Google online called How to Address Vocal Vaccine Deniers in Public. And I helped write that document. And one of the pieces that's in it it talks about the five strategies that vocal vaccine deniers, whether they're in public or whether they're one-on-one -on -one like you and I, Jay, they use. And it's standard. You just listen and you start seeing it like this. And they're the same ones that science deniers, are, deniers use, just like Donald Trump. So once I've told you them, every time you see Trump, you're gonna say, I know what he's doing. Okay, one of them is conspiracy. One of them is fake experts. Okay, not real experts, but fake experts. One of them is selectivity. They pick this tiny little piece out of a study and forget to tell you all the other piece that went in the study that changes the whole context for that selectivity. They want something to be 100% safe and effective. Getting out of bed is not 100% safe. There is nothing that's 100% safe and there's no drug that's 100% effective, okay? And then the last one, is misrepresentation and false logic. So just as an example, just because something happens 
after something, it doesn't mean it caused it. All right? So those five things are what they use. So when you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with a patient who is a vaccine denier, or it might be the husband who's the vaccine denier, you actually have to listen very carefully to the patient to find out what that patient's concerns are. And the question I usually ask, and have asked for a long time, and it's powerful, what would it take to move you to a yes? And then you shut up and listen. Don't prompt them, listen. Because what they'll actually tell you then is often very powerful. It may be a safety concern, in which case you have to deal with the safety issues around vaccines. They're very safe. They're safer than drugs, okay, by far, okay? Second thing is, it may not have anything to do with safety. It may be a constraint issue. They can't get there. It may be, a you know, it's costing them money to do this. Like if we delivered it in a different way, we could do it. It may be because the husband, the mother-in-law, the neighbor, the aunt, whatever, is against it. You have to hear this and then figure out how to help that person deal with that concern. Mm -hmm.